Hello and welcome to La Rosa Reads. I'm Denise La Rosa and today I am sharing with all you lovelies all of the books that I read in March. Let's talk books. What a month March was. I am surprised, but yet not too surprised to say that I read 11 books. On average, I read about seven to eight books a month. However, I did have a two week vacation squeezed into the month of March, which allowed me to read more than I usually can read given my regular day to day schedule. So I'm going to share all of those books with you today. The first batch of books I'm going to share with you are all of the books that I read for middle grade March. I was only able to read three books for middle grade March this year because I wanted to leave room for other types of genres for this month. I didn't want to make it a complete middle grade March month, but those three books are definitely worth my time and worth me sharing with all of you. The first book that I read for middle grade March is titled Lena and the Burning of Greenwood, a Tulsa Race Massacre survival story from the Girls Survive series. This is the first book from the Girls Survive series that I have read, and after this reading experience, I definitely plan on reading more of these books from the series Girls Survive. The Tulsa Race Massacre is unfortunately a part of our American history that has not really been given the time that it needs and deserves. It is an important story and a part of the fabric of our history in this country. However, I did not come to learn about the Tulsa Race Massacre until my adult years. And I think, quite frankly, that is just so disheartening, so quite disgusting, really, that we don't learn about these types of histories that are a part of our history. So Lena, this main character, and her family live in Greenwood, which is an all black neighborhood area in Tulsa that is based on a real, all of this is based on a real story. This area was just thriving and black folks could see themselves in every aspect of this society. And it was doing so well. And unfortunately, a man was convicted of causing harm on a white woman near Tulsa ended up being falsely accused. We find that he was not guilty, but this enraged a lot of white people in the surrounding area in the Tulsa area. And they came to Greenwood and just tore the place up, burned it down. And with that burning came trauma with the escape of all of the black people who lived in this um, neighborhood, this area, and also just the fact that this wealthy black society was literally disintegrated before the very eyes of those who, those residents. And so having Lena, this character, being so relatable, um, such an endearing character, really allows young people and even older readers like myself to fully immerse themselves in this story and to be able to see themselves or see someone they know experience this awful, awful trauma, which helps you learn in a way that's tangible for young people and also um, tugs at the heartstrings and brings about empathy in ways that um, I think reading just a factual biography or um a factual story on it maybe wouldn't elicit those emotions from young people so i think the author um nikki shannon smith did a phenomenal job this is such an important and um traumatic story and the way she was able to give it its due and honor the history the story and be truthful with it while not traumatizing the young readers was just so She's just so gifted. I mean, that is not an easy task. And I feel like this author did a phenomenal job with making this book accessible and meaningful to young readers and for this adult reader too. So it was a great start to middle grade March. And my next middle grade March book was Holler of the Fireflies, which I was greatly anticipating because it takes place in West Virginia, this fictional town in West Virginia, and I just felt like it would be my vibe. Our main character, Javari, is from Bushwick, 
in New York and he ends up going to the STEM camp in rural West Virginia. I always say rural West Virginia, like West Virginia is just rural, like, so you know what I mean, in a small town in West Virginia. And he ends up discovering new aspects of himself. He ends up still being this quirky kid. I love how this book didn't um, show this perfectly polished, transparent, formative experience for him where Javari starts off as this nerdy, um, awkward kid and comes out like a new man. You know, it, it really held on to his personality and also at the same time, having us see how he was able to grow from this experience. And not only is he finding himself and having these wonderful fun STEM activities and experiences that we read about, he's um, trying to figure out himself through these connections or disconnections that he's making with um, the fellow campers. He never really quite fits in, ever. And I love that about this book, that you know, it's not like he finds his tribe and his people. Like, no, sometimes you go to camps growing up and you don't find your people and you still have fun. And so that's what happens to Javari. But he does find a person who is not a camper, but a resident of this small town in West Virginia. This young man's name is Cricket. He's a biracial kid from West Virginia. And so Javari sneaks out at night and hangs out with Cricket unbeknownst to the um, camp coordinators. And that's really where his biggest learning takes place. I enjoyed this book. It kind of drug on for me. I feel like um, the story was just prolonged and there was a lot of nothing happening, nothing really huge or transformational to the story, no climactic moments until the very end. And then we have this big thing that happens at the end of the book and then the book's over and the pacing from when that incident happens to the end is like boom, bam, boom. And I'm like, this is a lot and I wasn't expecting it to take on such a somber tone and serious tone. So I think the pacing was a little off. However, I really appreciate David Barclay more for his efforts in this book. Um, having a character like Javari and a black boy being involved and interested in STEM and stretching himself from a city boy to this country lifestyle. I really appreciated that. I do feel the last thing I'll say is that I feel like he, the author really had a firm grasp and handle and knowledge and sense of the city characters from Bushwick. But when it came to us West Virginians, I feel like he portrayed us in such an exaggerated way. I wouldn't say he made caricatures out of the residents of the small town in West Virginia, but he definitely exaggerated their personalities. One thing that really got at me is that people were saying hi to each other by saying, howdy, howdy. We don't talk like that in West Virginia. We don't go, howdy, you know, um, that's just not our thing. So it was a lot of those Western, um, that's what my friend Katie who gave me this book said, you know, the Western language that sometimes gets projected or perceived by people, like it gets projected on West Virginians, but we have a Southern language. We don't have a Western language. Other than that, the book was okay. So it was a good time. And the last book that I read for middle grade March was a classic. In fact, one of the classics that I had on my TBR to read for this year, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963 by Christopher Paul Curtis. I have read But Not Buddy by Christopher Paul Curtis. So that book was an okay experience for me. It wasn't a stellar reading experience, but I was feeling like it was a good enough experience that I was looking forward to reading The Watsons Go to Birmingham. Kenny is another nerd. I'm just loving the nerdy black boys. They're just so endearing as characters, um, so refreshing, so lovable, and Kenny was no different. I just love him as a main character. And then we also have his parents, we have his older brother and his younger sister, and they are just a wacky family. They call themselves the Weird Watsons. They are just an eclectic bunch. I think that's a good way to put it. So we have in the beginning of this book, um, like vignettes, if you will, of different 
um, Watson family moments that are hilarious. I found myself laughing out loud, um, particularly the one where the older brother uh, gets his hair fried, dyed, and laid to the side. So funny. Um, and then all of a sudden, because his brother Byron, his Kenny's big brother Byron, is um, experiencing some troubles and being naughty, his parents decide it's time for him to travel to Birmingham and stay with his maternal grandmother, who will whip him into shape. That leads the family to traveling to Birmingham, which doesn't happen until like the second half of the book. So I found that to be a little annoying that the book is called The Watsons Go to Birmingham, and they don't go to Birmingham until like a little over halfway into the book. So um, I digress. Then once they get to Birmingham, they have some fun moments, um, a little bit of a culture shock because they're from Flint, Michigan. Um, his mother being from Birmingham, hasn't been home for a long time, is like so excited to be back in the South. And then at the very end, much like Holler of the Fireflies, I feel like that author, you know, was taking notes and read this book. At the very end, we have a traumatic event that is um, a, the author's way of paying homage to the four, I believe it's four young girls who were murdered at the burning of the church in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama um, in the 60s. And I'm like, whoa, this book was uh, so comical and funny. And then it takes a serious tone at the very end. It was a little jarring. So this book lacked fluidity for me. I can see why people love it, um, are drawn to it, but I definitely think it's a little overrated because um, yeah, it just lacked fluidity for me. I, I felt too many emotions without a transition to those emotions, but I'm glad I read The Watsons Go to Birmingham. I am so excited to show you the Davenports. I don't know why I'm singing this song for this book, but I finally read The Davenports, you guys. This has been a book that I kept seeing the cover and it was just calling for your girl to grab it and read it. I am so excited that I did. It is a young adult novel that is just full of romance, full of drama. And I loved every minute of it. And the fact that this is the first book and what is to become a series is just, oh, I cannot wait. So Olivia seems to be the main character, but we're not just following that young lady. We are following Olivia and her sister, Helen, both of whom come from the Davenport's um, family. That is um, a family that owns a carriage company. Their father is a former enslaved man who has found wealth, found prestige in Chicago by founding this carriage company. His wife is just so sophisticated. Like they are such a wealthy, sophisticated black family. The time period is 1910. And I just love the fact that we are dealing with black wealth, a different narrative, a different perspective. So Olivia and Helen are sisters. They have an older brother, John, and the sisters are being pushed off into the world and by trying to find a man and get married and, you know, be about that rich life and carry on the Davenport wealth and name. John is going to carry on the family company, his training under his father. Helen is this wild, bold, eclectic woman who is into um, building cars and carriages, like mechanical things, which is very unbecoming for a woman at this time period. Olive is more the um, stereotypical, type of sophisticated, dainty, feminine girl. So the parents love that. And so they're dealing with romantic issues, love triangles. Then we have Olivia's friend, Ruby, who is also trying to find love and her dad is running for mayor. And that has caused them to invest a lot of money in that campaign, which is kind of not allowing her to live the wealthy life like she's used to. So she's dealing with that. And then we have Amy Rose, who is the maid of the Davenports, who was like pretty much like living there all of her life because her mother, prior to her mother's death, was the maid at the Davenports' home. All of this is just 
important for you to know because these characters are so essential to the storylines and the way their stories intersect and the way the side characters bring romance and intrigue into the lives of these main characters is just mwah, chef's kiss. I don't want to tell you too much more. Just know that you are in for a good time. It's like the rated PG or even PG-13 of Bridgerton. So if you're into that, you better check out The Davenports. All right, the next books I'm going to whiz through because they were a good time, but I definitely wanted to devote more time to those novels um, for middle grade March and that young adult novel, The Davenports. We have my first manga, Cats. It's the Evil Secret Society of Cats, actually. And it was interesting. I really had a hard time reading from right to left and it took a while to get used to, but the next thing you know, I forgot. The illustrations are adorbs. However, I wasn't really getting the humor. I thought this would be a lot funnier than it actually was. If you're a cat lover, it's one of those things like if you know, you know about like fur balls and and like cat hair all over you, like making fun of those kinds of things. That was fine, but I wanted a little more humor. So a little bit of a downer, but a good time nonetheless. And then there were Olive's two recommendations. Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore was absolutely amazing. Oh my gosh, it blew me away. I had like the cozy bookstore vibes. There was mystery. There was like some sci-fi mixed in. There was a little bit of everything going on in this book. It was dated in its language a little bit because I believe it came out in like 2012-ish. Forgive me if, it, if that date is wrong, but it still held true. It still held up. I love the talk of um, ebooks versus um, actual hard copies because that was all the debate and rage. We were wondering at the time that this book was written um, whether or not Kindles and, um, you know, all those e-readers were going to make our actual physical copies of books obsolete. We now know that did not happen, but at the time this book was written, um, having that be at the core of the storyline was really neat. I absolutely loved that book. I also loved Olive's other recommendation, Memorial Drive. It tugged at my heart. It is a book that is so haunting. This memoir by um, a former U.S. Poet Laureate is just divine. The writing is simply exquisite, breathtaking. This mother was murdered back in 1985. And in Memorial Drive, this memoir, you are venturing on this journey of a daughter's um, processing of that murder, the daughter trying to make sense of it and have it create meaning for her life. It was truly a read that I will never forget and it will always stay close to me. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend you read it. Content warning, it does deal with domestic violence and domestic abuse. So if that is something that's troubling for you, I want you to know that that's a part of this book. So if you can, if it's a book you think you can handle, please read Memorial Drive. Then there are two books that I don't have physical copies of because the first one was an audiobook, Crying in H Mart, a memoir by Michelle Zahner that so many people have been talking about and raving about for a couple of years now. So I'm late to the party, but I arrived at the party because the students at my school that I work at have a book club that they have invited me to participate in. They're the ones responsible for me reading The Song of Achilles and now crying in H Mart. This memoir also deals with the loss of a mother, a daughter's loss of her mother, this time due to cancer. It was gripping, it was heart-wrenching. I tell you, both of these books just really moved me deeply and I actually had to take breaks and take breaths because they were so moving in that way. Um, I enjoyed listening to the author share her truth, share her story, and I also got a chance to read my first NetGalley book for a review, and it is Full Exposure, a romance novel that was spicy and fun, an interracial romance between 
a Vietnamese man, fine man, and a black woman, a gorgeous woman, who meet in New Orleans. She is a DC native. He had lived in DC unbeknownst to her and has returned home to New Orleans and they meet at a Mardi Gras parade and sparks fly. It was your typical quintessential romance novel and there was a little bit of conflict as the romance progressed. The conflict got settled and resolved and we had a happy ending. All was a good time and I enjoyed it. So that was great and I'm excited to be a part of that galley now. So definitely check out my reviews. I've been reviewing all of these books on IG, on Instagram. So I hope you'll check those out if you want to hear more of my thoughts. I'm going to show you this book because I'm going to read it as I'm recording this. It's not quite the end of March yet and I anticipate I will finish this book. Who knows? But I want to give you a heads up that I've been reading an Autobiography of Skin, a novel by Lakeisha Carr. This is the March A. Maurice Book Club selection. I'm enjoying it thus far. It really follows um, a handful of women whose lives intersect. And I so far have read the story of the first woman who is quite the character. I think this book is going to be moving while also not too deep that I can feel myself laughing out loud sometimes. So I love that it a book that kind of takes me on that journey, but it isn't too heavy. I have those lighter moments that I can really see the character um, live life in, in a fuller, happier way, no matter how heavy their lives are. So I'm excited to read this book. I just may finish it in March. Yay, so here's my stack with the exception of the audiobook and the ebook that I read. And I hope that you had a fantastic reading month in March. What did you read? Are you going to read any of the books that I read? Let's chat it up in the comments below. Let me know. And if you want to know what I'm planning on reading in April, check out my April TBR video, which is right here. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.